In this episode of Restore It, I finally show you what happened with the touring and why it's taken me so long to get this episode out. The reason I started this engine bay cleanup was simply because I had the opportunity to do it whilst the engine was out getting overhauled. And obviously because it was in quite a bad state, I cleaned, de-rusted, etched, primed and painted it before deciding to remove the right engine covering plate and replace it with a new one. Again, just because I could and also to get some experience. After about 5 months of searching, I found a genuine replacement part and welded it in. With some filler, seam sealer and more paint, it was done and for a first timer I was very happy with it. Going forward in time to the last episode, I reinstalled all of the trim pieces and installed the engine ready for its first start. Now I'm sure a lot of you were expecting an engine start up in that episode and believe me so was I. Things just didn't go quite to plan. As this was the first time I'd put a pre-facelift engine into a facelift car, there were a few differences that I was unaware of. So now we're going to pick things up just after last episode. Here, myself and Dimitri from E3X Originals, you can find him here, are trying to work out where all of the connectors go to ensure everything is getting power and that the car will start. Which isn't the easiest things in E30s as BMW use the same type of connectors for a few things and either left them all unlabeled or their labels have disappeared over the years. After a little bit of research we decided that I was using the wrong loom and crankshaft pulley for the ECU so no power was getting sent to the DME relay, which meant no spark, fuel or idle control valve buzz. I set about swapping those out in hopes we'd get somewhere and have an easy fix early on. This is the pre-facelift engine loom from the sedan, the one that originally went with this engine. With the old slash new engine loom in, I added a few final pieces, like the oil coolant radiators, plugged in a known working idle control valve, tightened the gearbox mounts and filled her up with fluids. With everything ready to go and hopes high, it wouldn't even crank. Thankfully it was just a dead battery and easy fix. We swapped out the battery for a known working one and cranked her over for the first time in a while. With no spark, fuel or idle control valve buzz, it wasn't looking good at all. Because of the whole pre-facelift engine going into a facelift car situation, unbeknownst to me, my problems had just begun, and it would take many days before I'd even get close to knowing what the issue was. I spent many of my early mornings in the workshop going through manuals and testing what seemed like everything to make sure it was installed and working correctly. And I'd just like to thank today's sponsor for helping me get through that with a healthy and delicious breakfast, Magic Spoon Cereal. For most of my life, I've loved sugary cereals and I really thought I was done being able to eat them until I tasted Magic Spoon. Just look at this. Zero sugar, 11 grams of protein and only 3 net carbs, 110 calories per serving. It's grain free, gluten free and soy free. What is this stuff made out of then? Well believe it or not, it's basically protein powder. It's milk protein that they've somehow scienced into a cereal. The texture is almost identical to normal cereal and the flavour is identical I think. You've got your cocoa, fruity, frosted and blueberry. These colours are from vegetable juice, though you'd never guess it from tasting. And this cereal stays crunchy in milk or whatever milk substitute you're using. You've got to try Magic Spoon for yourself. You can order some online and get free shipping by using my promo code RESTORE-IT or you can go to magicspoon.com forward slash restore it. If you don't like it, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. But I think you're really going to like it. It's what I'm having for breakfast every morning these days. That code and URL are down below. Big thanks to Magic Spoon. Let's get back to the touring. So with no idea as to why it wasn't starting, my good friends Sergio and Dimitri came over to share some of their E30 knowledge with me. Sergio just so happens to be the owner of Bavarian Verka, an injector refurbishment specialist company, he'll take your old injectors and send you either new or refurbished versions of the same injectors, or suggest a newer, better but still compatible injector which will make your old engine run much smoother. Which is exactly what he's doing here. I got some M50 early M52 injectors which are an exact match to the old E30 ones. They just perform better and are way more efficient. I've been a passenger in Dimitri's touring with these injectors installed and I genuinely thought it was a non-E30 engine. It's a night and day difference. When Sergio tested my old injectors, they were so bad he just threw them away. 
They were certainly past their best and it was cheaper to just replace them with the better M50 version. With the new injectors fitted, I was more eager than ever to get it started and experience them for myself. But after even more research, it was decided that I had put the wrong gearbox and flywheel on the engine. Quite a mistake to make, I know. So after putting it off for a little bit and focusing on other videos to make sure I could pay the bills, I started the now familiar task of removing everything I had just installed, engine and gearbox included. So the reference sensor and the speed sensor were missing from the gearbox I had installed, and this is what we thought was preventing power getting to where it should be. It seemingly didn't matter which order I plugged the connectors in, and I had spent enough time on the E30 zone no start troubleshoot page to memorise it. Swapping the gearbox and flywheel out seemed like it was a guaranteed fix. This was actually the first time I had removed an engine pretty much on my own. Good experience, I guess. At this point, the lift was maxed out and I was knackered from all the jacking, wiggling and lifting. Thankfully, I had help from DJ for the final lift. With both of them out, I set about removing the starter and gearbox so I could get to the flywheel. Obviously I did remove the clutch, I just forgot to film it. So this is the notch I was talking about on the correct flywheel for the gearbox with sensors attached. This is the small notch that the sensors use to send information to the ECU, and this is the old one that as you can see is missing that notch. That's because the information is sent from the crankshaft pulley vibration damper and crank position sensor at the front of the facelift engines. And so it began, putting everything back together again and back in the car, and for the first time, completely on my own. With the gearbox torqued down, I could then reinstall the engine and hook everything back up, hopefully, actually, for the last time this time. After some staring, I decided I would carefully lift it onto and over the slam panel whilst manoeuvring the lift towards the car. Once clear, I could lower the engine back into place, not without a great deal of struggle of course. The red levelling tool you see is such a helpful thing to have, I'm not sure it would be this easy without it. With what felt like a lot of back and forth, I eventually got it lined up and dropped it into place. Once again, I installed the drive shaft and gearbox mounts. I really can't wait to have a car lift. With the engine and gearbox secure, I could then install the engine loom, fuel lines and fill her back up with oil. I killed all of the batteries in the workshop, so Dimitri hooked up his very cool 1997 E38 740IL, and with our fingers crossed, hoped she would just fire up. Yeah. There. Although it was cranking, it still wouldn't start. We still had no spark, fuel or idle control valve buzz. 
By this point I had changed the loom over what must have been six times and ran tests on both without any success. As the gearbox with the sensors was attached, I knew either way that it could stay in there as I could choose to use them or not, as this whole thing was temporary anyway. And so because of that and because it was on the list of things to do, I installed the exhaust just to get it out of the way. However, I only managed to install the first half as I was on my own and on the floor and it was just too awkward to get the back end in. So in the end after testing all of the relays, the fuel pump, the idle control valve, the TPS, the coil, the ECU and more, as well as adding a new battery and even separating the wires to make sure there was nothing untoward going on as I was really lost for ideas, we finally found the correct place for everything to go. The main culprit was the DME and fuel pump relay not being in the right places on the right looms. With the idle control valve making a noise for the first time since I started this whole rebuild, I quickly put everything back together and added just the oil. I've learnt now not to over prepare for something like this. It won't go well until it does and only then should you add everything it needs for continuous running. And so this was it. It was making all the right noises with the ignition key turned to the on position. It just needed to fire up and stay running. Well that's a relief. It started quite easily but was idling way too high. A quick adjustment on the throttle cable sorted that issue and even with half the exhaust on it sounded like everything was running as it should and if not smoother than it was before. With the engine finally started I could then attach the bonnet and add the rest of the fluids. I don't know why I thought the bonnet should be put on like this and that I needed a friend's help or a lift, but it turns out you can do it without a friend's help or a lift by laying it down flat over the engine and tightening it from underneath. I attached it in a random position, removed the lift and tested it to see where I was before making a slight adjustment to get it to align. With new paint over the bonnet hinge and absolutely no lubrication on any of the parts, even if it was aligned, it wouldn't have moved. I gave everything a spray with WD-40 just to get things moving for now. I needed to adjust the right bonnet runner to make it even smoother than that, but the alignment was surprisingly good for a single adjustment I thought. I think it sat slightly lower than it should be at the front, but I'll leave it for now as it's about to be shipped back to the UK. Lastly, I reinstalled the grills and filled the brake and clutch reservoirs before bleeding the clutch and driving her out. It was a great drive after not being able to drive an E30 for so long. Big thanks once again to Magic Spoon. Be sure to check out the variety pack and get free shipping with a link or code in the description. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.